Last but not least, the pleasure of chairing this panel goes to our very own professor, Gabor Klanitsai from the Department of Medieval Studies. Okay, thank you, Evren, and uh, welcome everybody to this session. I'm very glad to, to be part of this enterprise. I was there already the first day, although a little bit delay. And uh, now it's a pleasure to chair this session on medievalisms, politics, and identity. Our first speaker is Annika Christensen from the University of Leeds, who is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Leeds Arts Humanities Research Institute at the University of Leeds. And she has a, a recently completed doctoral thesis, which investigated the use of medieval ballad in contemporary culture in the Faroe Islands. Uh, her areas of interest include the use of medieval imagery, symbolism and narratives in contemporary culture, as well as critical cultural studies of Scandinavia and the North Atlantic, especially the smaller communities that often are left behind in global political and cultural agendas. And her paper is on whiteness as an indicator of Nordic authenticity, exploring the images of whiteness in video games. Annika, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. Right. Um, so thank you all for coming to uh, to listen to uh, this panel. And uh, yeah, as Gabby mentioned, uh, my paper is going to focus on uh, whiteness as kind of an indicator of uh, kind of authentic Nordic identities. Um, this ties into the fact that the inclusion of uh, medieval Scandinavia and a Norse mythology has been prevalent in the gaming industry for several years. And in recent games are, for example, God of War uh, from 2018, made by uh, Santa Monica Studios, and Assassin's Creed Valhalla, uh, which is a Ubisoft game that came out uh, last year. So this paper will explore how these games uh, use whiteness as a marker of belonging and cultural origin. Um, and in fact, in return, produced this kind of white essentialism um, as markers of Scandinavian and Nordic identity, authenticity, sorry. Um, however, it is important uh, to also mention that this, can, this phenomenon um, is not unique to the representation of Scandinavian medievalisms but it's part of a larger, much more complex uh, discourse of critical race uh, theory. <clears throat> uh, there has been a lot of work on this, uh, which I'm not gonna go into uh, much detail in this paper, but one of the kind of leading scholars in this area is uh, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw uh, and her concept of intersectionality um, used to kind of understand how aspects of a personal person's social and political identity uh, kind of combine to create a different modes of discrimination and privilege. Um, and it's also important to mention uh, in this case that whiteness does not refer to only skin color but uh, more the construction of uh, an ideological uh, position of privilege and whiteness as a kind of default reference point. Uh, I'll also argue that kind of other representation are either excluded or veiled in kind of stereotypical displays of blatant uh, exoticism. And I will also argue that this cannot be isolated in uh, the industry of popular video games, but it is kind of a social uh, cultural um, issue, systematic exclusion of Scandinavian and Nordic identities aren't white. Um, and I will look at these video games from two kind of, which I find complementary uh, theoretical standpoints. One of them being Christian Schramm's uh, concept of Borealism um, and the discussion um, of Nordic exceptionalism by Christian Lofstadter and Lars Jensen. 
Um, so Borealism uh, was kind of largely developed by uh, Christian Schramm by reworking Edward Said's uh, concept of Orient Orientalism uh, from 1978. And this kind of this concept kind of draws uh, on on the similar issues that video games have in using um, essential whiteness as marker for Nordic or Scandinavian authenticity. Uh, Schramm's discussion of Borealism, which he defines as uh, the sig signification, practice, and performance of the ontological and epistemological distinction in power between the North and the South. Um, and she also is indicating that there are certain expectations uh, of representation of Scandinavian or Nordic persons. Uh, because Borealism kind of refers to uh, an exoticization of the North, uh, which in, includes Scandinavia and the North uh, Atlantic countries, um, including the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, uh, and also Finland. Um, and kind of tied into this is also the concept of Nordicness, which Michael Fjelser and Sanne Kohl uh, Groth describe in this way, uh, that Nordicness is an open signifier, as concepts of Nordicness can be associated with either something dark, cold and obscure, or something related to light, brightness and the aurora borealis. Um, and this is where we kind of come into Nordic exceptionalism. Uh, Kristen Lofstetter and Lars Jensen write that whiteness is kind of an intrinsic part of Nordic exceptionalism and Nordic kind of self-representation. Uh, in relation to the Scandinavian region, um, Kristen Lofstetter and Lars Jensen uh, use the term Nordic exceptionalism to refer to kind of the historical discourse of Scandinavian and Nordic identity based in um, 19th century uh, romanticism, which revolves around uh, the kind of notion of the Nordic countries as global good citizens, peace-loving, conflict resolution oriented and rational. Um, this has become sort of, a, we call it kind of a national regional branding. Um, because as they kind of also argue is that Nordic countries have actively engaged in anti-racist and anti-imperial activities since the 1970s. But what they also include that they have done so kind of without questioning their own involvement in colonial and uh, racist activities. Um, and this is where kind of Scandinavian me medieval imagery plays an important role. Um, the medieval heritage of Sweden, Denmark and Norway was kind of uh, reimagined as part of uh, romantic idealism in the 19th century um, and kind of still prevails to this day as components of uh, contemporary Scandinavian identities. Um, these issues of authenticity are presented in relation to the depict uh, depiction of medieval Scandinavia and Norse mythologies. Uh, and uh, these are often related to uh, racial representation in particular. And there are indications that representation of characters that are not white is problematic when it comes to creating an authentic uh, representation in a fictive uh, reproduction of medieval Scandinavian Norse mythology. Uh, the medieval imagery has in contemporary popular culture largely conflating uh, creating a form of kind of pan-Scandinavian representation of heritage. And uh, the important symbols uh, of this are uh, Vikings, Norse mythology, and kind of the stories derived from the time and pe period, um, including, for example, the Icelandic sagas and the medieval ballads. Um, but in terms of kind of a cultural identity and contemporary cultural identity, uh, the Scandinavian countries uh, now share quite a lot of signifiers uh, and perhaps the most prominent are the uses of medievalisms to uh, where it's used to kind of uh, underpin white authenticity um, and nationalistic discourses. 
So here are just some of the uh, examples of what I can mean by that. Um, firstly, we have uh, posters from two TV series kind of uh, representing the Vikings. So we have Vikings, um, the Canadian and Norsemen as well. Uh, we have for Viking heavy metal band Toy, for example. So this uh, uh, is uh, kind of at the one end and then on the other end of the extreme, um, we have uh, the Nordic resistance movement and the soldiers of Odin, which are two kind of far right, uh, alt right uh, uh, groups that have factions across Scandinavia and the North. Um, I kind of therefore want to argue that these issues of representation is uh, not based uh, necessarily on a desire for an accurate representation, but is kind of informed by contemporary perception of Nordic exceptionalism uh, and whiteness as a marker of Scandinavian and Nordic identity. So the video games that I have looked at is God of War and Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So both of these are set in worlds inspired by either Norse mythology um, or the Nordic Scandinavian region. Um, so God of War draws heavily on Norse mythology in particular, where characters are based on the Nordic gods and the realm uh, in Nordic mythology, such as Niflheim, Helheim. And throughout the game, you're also told uh, various stories from Nordic mythology, which are all uh, narrated, narrated uh, by the decapitated head of Mimi. Um, Valhalla is slightly different in that case that it depicts a group of Vikings from Norway traveling to England. And throughout the game, you're tasked with conquering the country. Uh, there is some loose kind of correlation to uh, actual uh, historical figures and the imagination of the game developers. Uh, for example, uh, in there you meet the sons of Lachna, Ragnar Lothbrok. Um, so as we can see from this kind of uh, few clips, uh, the majority of the characters in these two games are depicted as white and kind of reinforcing the idea that medieval Scandinavia, um, including the realms in Norse mythology, uh, were mostly made up of white people. Um, in God of War, you play as Kratos, uh, which uh, is more of a Greek god um, than a Scandinavian one. And he's also the only character in the game that's voiced by a black actor, um, actor Christopher Judge. All the non-playable characters uh, with any dialogue uh, are white. And the only black female character is a very formidable, but also very silent Valkyrie. Um, in Valhalla, you can choose between a female or male character, but you cannot change skin color or other features. Um, again, there's only one black voice actor called Chantel, Chantel Riley. Um, what also is notable here that Riley voices a character that's kind of based in the 21st century in the game. Um, this is kind of because the game jumps between the 9th and the 21st centuries. Um, all of the Scandinavian and British characters are voiced by white actors. Um, this also includes Odin, Loki and Freya. Uh, from Norse mythology. Um, Dietrich uh, also found this in their work when they wrote that most of online uh, video games do not allow for a creation of avatars with a non-white racial appearance, which has the potential of making whiteness the default racial um, ethnicity of game characters. Um, Hara also writes that uh, the wish to play games as a casual pastime expedites the incidental circulation of imperial, um, imperialist ideologies. Um, so although not explicitly um, anti-immigration or racist or exclusionary, uh, whiteness in video games still kind of denotes a type of authenticity when it comes to how Scandinavia uh, 
uh, is represented in the medieval past in these video games. Um, Toni Morrison expressed the discourse of critical studies of whiteness uh, within an American contract text when uh, she stated that uh, in this country, American means white. Everyone else has to hyphenate. <clears throat> uh, meaning that kind of this whiteness as an identifier of national belonging can only exist on the expense or exclusion uh, of others. Um, Catherine Horde and Samuel writing uh, kind of relate this to the Scandinavian um, example uh, or the North. Uh, where they write that the valorizing of the North draws on symbols of particular ethnic traditions to give historicity and local meaning to white identity. Um, and that this uh, particular rhetoric is uh, displaying kind of a, a claim to ethnic exclusivity, um, whether intentional or not. Um, the rhetoric and imagery used um, uh, kind of relies on a slightly oppressive interpretation of Scandinavian medieval heritage and the way it informs contemporary cultural identity in the region. Uh, there is a general lack of acknowledgement of the exclusion that's happening on the basis of cultural uh, and ethnic exclusivity, um, as if the representation of Scandinavian medieval heritage uh, is not real enough uh, unless it's kind of cloaked in, in whiteness. There are ongoing discussions uh, on representation in video games, and there are also a lot of instances where game developers have argued uh, for kind of the authentic uh, representation of medieval Scandinavia when they're defending the exclusively white characters. Um, but at the same time, these games also include mythical creatures and gods from uh, mythology making a kind of a feeble claim how games made in the 21st century seem uh, kind of blind to the fact that including diversity in their characters if is perhaps not that far a stretch. Um, so uh, just to conclude, uh, depiction of medieval Scandinavia on screen has been and continues to be popular, but there are still issues with whiteness being seen as a marker of Scandinavian um, heritage and identity. Uh, not only does this exclude the many that have uh, immigrated to the region, um, but it also disregards representation of the uh, indigenous communities in Scandinavia, so for example, Sami communities. Um, it depicts a kind of a white Scandinavian, although games um, are a pastime, and often only seen as such, um, it is uh, important to again repeat Hara in, in that these kind of casual pastimes can also include the kind of incidental circulation of imperial um, imperialist ideologies. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice paper, and uh, it's very important to uh, uh, spot uh, these ideological elements in all these uh, representations. And uh, I think that uh, uh, this is precisely the aim of this section. So uh, if there are questions or comments, uh, please uh, uh, write them in the chat so that we know. And why are you thinking? Maybe I, I abuse of my position and uh, chairing the session. And uh, let me ask. Uh, the first uh, Gabor, Gabor uh, I'm sorry. We, we normally have the three papers and the Q&A at the end. OK. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I made a mistake in my role. Yes. So the questions and answers uh, will come after that. And uh, now we move on uh, to the second paper uh, of Stephen Hope who is from Linnaeus University. And Stefan Hope has a PhD in medieval history from the University of Southern Denmark. His main interests are the cult of saints, identity construction, and history writing, and the ways in which uh, these themes intersect. And he also works on medieval manuscript, uh, manuscript fragments, especially liturgical material. 
so he's coming from very far to the <laughs> current uh, issues. Uh, Stefan Hope is currently a research assistant at the project mapping lived religion at Linnaeus University in Sweden. And uh, his paper is on dreams of a Norse origin story, fantasy, pseudo history and fiction in the receptions of the Vinland sagas. So Stefan, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, yes, I have come a long way um, thematically. So this is very much a work in progress, and I'm I'm trying to share some some ideas that I hope to develop further into some some more strands. <clears throat> so my starting point is the historical um, encounter between indigenous cultures in the America and. Um, and the Norse, uh, sorry, the Norse, uh, uh, well, sailors or, or however we call them. And um, I want to show how the, the reception of this historical contact, which, which we do know from archaeological evidence, um, how that has been developed into a, um, well, a sort of topos from for for uh, popular culture and how that has been imagined, reimagined, uh, developed, and and fantasized about. And my main point that I want you to to really take away from this is that these fantasies about uh, an ex what, I, what I call an extended contact between um, Norse and, and indigenous American cultures um, that. Uh, first of all, it, it's ubiquitous, and secondly, um, we should see that as having an impact on modern or contemporary politics. Exactly how that impact is is uh, enacted, how it, it is performed, how it comes about, that requires a much more detailed examination, so I'm not going to answer that, but I, I want to yeah, lay the groundwork for how we should understand these expressions of um, uh, medievalist imaginings in a in a contemporary uh, political context. So, first of all, I do want to have a quick note about names. I'm going to I'm, I'm using the the term Norse for talking about the the um, people of some sort of Nordic descent. Uh, it's a general term, it's problematic, but it's less problematic than, let's say, Viking, which is truly problematic, and also Nordic, which has been recently hijacked by uh, right-wing extremists. Uh, there's also the question of how to talk about the very diverse um, groups of people who lived in what we now call America. Um, and these are just some of the uh, names that, that can be used. I go for indigenous uh, on the advice of some Canadian colleagues. Um, it's also important to note that in Greenland, there was, of course, the contact between uh, the Norse and uh, the Inuit. And um, they are also, uh, well, we know them now as Inuit, um, and, and there are also some other terms that I, I'm avoiding here because they are um, they are chronologically problematic. But this is just to, to you know, make you make you aware of, of the um, the terminology and and how problematic it can be or how tricky it can be to navigate um, these these names. Now the main argument um, for my talk is that. In the in the insurrection that took place in uh, on Capitol Hill in Washington D.C. on January the sixth this year, we we did see uh, especially one figure, the um, infamous Jacoby, who whose image I will not share here. It will just further his cause. But we saw that he was he was dressed in um, a Native American uh, or sorry indigenous uh, headgear, and. Um, he had runes uh, tattooed on, on his torso. So this is uh, an appropriation of both indigenous cultures and also uh, Norse culture. And I w um, while I don't claim to know anything about the mechanics or, or the um, rationale behind 
his particular blend of these two uh, cultures, broadly understood, I think it's a good touchstone for how we understand um, the way in which the historical contact between Norse and indigenous cultures can be used and abused uh, by, by the political uh, right. And um, also how this can be or must be understood against the background of um, more than a century of, um, of popular culture and, and public discourse. Um, so I'm not making any any conclusions about the, the about how um, various right wing organisations are influenced by uh, specific expressions of of um, medievalism in popular culture, but I, I I rather want to stress how ubiquitous it is, and, and that there are therefore many many ways to um, to see influences happening. Just a quick background, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with the, the historical part of it, uh, we do know that, that um, uh, people of a Norse background, however we, we understand that, um, did make landfall on what is now known as the American continent. Uh, the extent of, of that contact um, is unknown, but Archaeological excavations in, in recent years um, have shown that that uh, they that people traveled, especially from Greenland to um, areas like Newfoundland and Labrador, more frequently uh, than we thought. That there is, um, yeah, that there, hap- there was more that happened than than we know about. Um, however, um, I think it's safe to say that the historical contact is much more, was much more limited than what has been imagined in, in popular culture. Uh, and I here want to say that while this, this conference is mostly on, well, it's, it's on uh, 21st century audiovisual culture, I also try to see that in connection with uh, 20th century popular culture, not only audiovisual. <clears throat> now, um, this idea of the uh, of an extended contact, um, or, or rather the, the historical contact between Norse and, and indigenous cultures, it quickly became a, a tool for identity construction amongst uh, especially Scandinavian uh, immigrants in, in the USA in the, from the uh, 19th century onwards, um, the high point of which surely must be the uh, proclamation of Life Ericsson Day. Um, and uh, even before uh, the proclamation of Life Ericsson Day, uh, we, we see that it was that the, the contact between between Norse and indigenous cultures was in a, a very deeply rooted part of popular culture. Um, so I will only touch on some aspects of this um, of this impact. There is this is a very rich subject, so I'm I'm going to be a bit all over the place in terms of how I, I illustrate this. Um, so feel free to, to ask if there is anything that needs to be clarified and I'm, I apologize for um, jumping about a bit. Now, there are three themes that I, uh, through which I, I want to examine this impact on, on popular culture. And I call this a bit clumsily, uh, an extended chronology of contact, an extended geography of contact and an extended impact of contact. Uh, and as I, I hope to emphasize, these three themes um, tie into each other and, and they're not inseparable, uh, quite the opposite. They often fuel each other, but they must be understood on, on different levels as I, as I hope to show. If I haven't shown that by the end, feel free to ask. Now, I want to begin with the extended chronology. And what I mean by this is that the chronological frame of contact between Norse and indigenous cultures um, has been extended and sometimes uh, massively extended in the cultural imagination. Traditionally, we see uh, that the, or we consider the, the date of contact as being uh, the year 1000 AD, roughly thereabout. Um, in popular culture, however, you, you do see that this, this contact is extended backwards in time. Uh, the earliest example I have 
encountered goes back to the um, 5th century AD. Um, and it also removes the endpoint. So we, we don't think to, or we usually don't consider any, any such contact uh, possible after the 15th century on, on account of the decline of the settlement in, in Greenland. Uh, but in um, the cultural imagination, any such endpoint is, is removed. There is also um, an increased frequency of contact. Like I said, we, we can be fairly sure that, that uh, the contact between Norse and, and indigenous cultures happen more frequently than, uh, than we can be sure of, um, simply because this is how history works. We, we can only see a glimpse of, of the grand total. Um, but when you see the, the frequency um, suggested in, in a lot of popular culture, I think it's fair to say that, that popular culture is taking a bit, things a bit too far in, in that regard. Now, the point of, or one of the consequences rather of um, the extended chronology is, first of all, that it exaggerates the potential influence between the cultures. Um, and that can be done in uh, a large number of, of ways. And um, I should here say that uh, this need not be this need not be um, politically problematic. It, it might not be uh, it might not have racist um, over undertones, but sometimes it does. Uh, and therefore, it also ties into to what Annika was was talking about when it comes to uh, whiteness as a cultural marker of identity. Um, that this also um, looms in the background when we talk about the extended chronology, well, when we talk about this subject, really. One of the main, let's say, risks um, of this, these imaginings in popular culture is that the extended chronology might become a chronological. So you have um, no periodization, you have no distinction between uh, various historical periods. Everyone lives in the same, um, well, in the same time space, uh, essentially. Um, and this is also helped by, by the nebulous nature of the term Norse. So it means that Norse and, and Vikings are used um, interchangeably. It means that while we have, while scholarship um, considers the Viking age as a distinct period, uh, popular culture obliterates that periodization and you have Vikings uh, all across the chronological scale. On the one hand, um, a chronology opens up for very interesting narratives and hypothetical scenarios. And I'm, I should emphasize that I'm not, I'm not against such fantasies. They, they, can, be, they can be employed in, in very useful and entertaining and, and positive ways. Um, but because it feeds into a blurred understanding of historical time, which, which we already have quite prevalent among, uh, among non-experts in history, uh, it does allow for an easier acceptance of unhistorical claims. It becomes a bit, a bit easier to to accept ideas that that uh, experts and or people who are um, lay people, but but um, who are well re well well versed in in the topic, might find quite uh, preposterous. Uh, so this is a, a, a the groundwork that that a blending of or an extension of the chronology in this in this case actually facilitates. Uh, some examples of this we see in the game uh, Settlers, where we have Romans, Vikings, and Aztecs uh, fighting together. <clears throat> um, the main problem here, of course, is that the Aztecs, um, as as we know them at least, they only e emerged as a, as a political entity in the um, 14th century at the at the earliest. Uh, so well beyond the, the uh, temporal scale of the Viking period, to say nothing about the Romans, um, if we then discount the, the Byzantine use of, of Roman, of course. Um, this should also be understood uh, against a, a, a long-standing topos of, of popular culture. One of the uh, most famous uh, examples of this um, can, of course, be seen in Prince Valiant. And this is the uh, 
the earliest example I've, I found of a, a, a chronological extension backwards in time. Um, Prince Valiant is both a, a knight of the round table and is also a Viking uh, living in the fifth century. Um, and in this case, as we have seen, as, as can be seen in, in several other comics and, and videos, uh, sorry, uh, games and, and, um, and films, uh, it, it employs the, the idea of the white god of the Aztecs, which is now a disproved Another example here, again, Vikings and Aztecs uh, inhabiting the same timescape. Um, and this also ties in with uh, what I call extended geography. Um, and extended geography is um, functions in a, in a similar way. Um, while we know that the historical geographical remit um, of, of contact was quite, um, was, was quite limited, um, popular culture imagines it uh, as going further inland, for the south, and uh, this opens up to the kind of contact uh, between other indigenous cultures that, that the contact between the Aztecs and the Vikings, which could never have happened, uh, is an example of. Now, this also has a lot of implications when the geographical frame is, is extended. Uh, it, it, it exaggerates the strength of, of the Norse uh, settlements. Um, it um, exaggerates um, the general presence and also their contact uh, with indigenous cultures. It also opens up for a long, uh, for, a, for different, uh, for a list of different narratives that can be employed when, when playing with this idea. You have the Vikings as a sort of proto-Columbians, um, explorers, conquerors. Um, it can be seen as heroic, picaresque. Uh, these are just some of the ways in which we can understand how, how this, these narratives are, uh, are shaped. And this is made possible because uh, the, geogra the geographical contact um, or remit of contact is extended. Uh, one example of this uh, can be seen in the in the multimedia online game Klondike, which uh, where you well the geographical setting is Klondike uh, on the opposite side of the American continent from where the, uh, the Norse landed, uh, and yet you here can collect Viking sets as an example of the the extended geographical um, remit of of contact, and of course the helmets have horns, as we know. A similar case can be seen in the commuter game Dead in Vinland, um, which despite the title uh, or the name of the title of Vinland, uh, you find stone statues that are very reminiscent of Toltec culture. So this is, a, uh, while, while Norse and, and Toltecs inhabited the same um, chrono chronological period, and they never met, um, this is uh, an example of geographical extension because we, we can be fairly sure they, the Norse never got that far south. Now, um, in my third topic, um, extended contact, I think uh, we can see much more clearly how these two themes, uh, the, these two previous themes tie together. Because we have here um, the combination of an extended chronological frame, an extended geographical remit, and this of course allows for perhaps even necessitate a greater cultural impact uh, on, on indigenous cultures. This can take place between uh, or through the idea of family ties. Um, Prince Valiant and the New World is an interesting case, although there we see that um, uh, an indigenous woman marries uh, a Norse man and goes back to Norway with, with him. So it's a, it's a different impact, but it's a, still a, a greater cultural impact than can historically be attested. Um, we see this also in the film Pathfinder, for instance, and, and other cases. Uh, then there is the greater cultural impact through exploration and conquest. Um, the, the best example of this in, is in the computer game Age of Empires, where, um, well, the entire medieval period is just one, uh, one timescape, essentially. And this is where I want to... to um, it's, it's especially from this game that I, I want to draw most of my examples of this, um, uh, these two themes of extended geography and, and uh, chronology being woven into an extended contact. 
Uh, for instance, in Age of Empires, it's possible to, to pit the Vikings, as they are called there, against the Maya. Historically, this would be possible. They, they lived and or they function in the same time period. Uh, historically, it is extremely unlikely to be, to be kind. Uh, but we see also that it allows for um, an extended chronology, and indeed an achronology. Because here we have, uh, this is just one possible way of, of playing the game, uh, where we see that uh, the, the Vikings are fighting Maya, Aztecs, and Incas. Um, and the A chronology is really emphasized when we consider the historical uh, periods in which these historical rulers actually lived. So we do get um, more than a thousand years represented in one single game. And this is made possible because of the extended chronology. Um, there is also the idea of a continuous settlement um, in, in America. Um, there is the topos of relict Norse settlements, um, which, in, uh, which can be seen as a way of Americanizing the Vikings. My favorite example of this is uh, these two Vikings from the cartoon uh, DuckTales from, uh, from 1989-90, uh, where, um, where they are looting root beer. Um, this can also be seen. Plot keywords from the from the um, international movie database. It's a bit difficult to see here on the on the screen, but here you have Viking speedboats and root beer in one in one and the same cultural expression. So this is really Americanizing the the Vikings. Now, with this extended contact, the extended geography, the extended chronology, um, I suggest that what we have here is the um, well, a very fertile soil for um, an ex, uh, a Norse origin story that can be utilized and, and abused uh, by... Um, Stephen, sorry. sorry, you have three minutes left. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it um, lays the ground for a, a Norse origin story. Uh, I'm not saying that it necessarily has done this, but but um, we see that we see how this can become... Uh, possible. So the question is, of course, uh, do these fantasies about extended Norse contact with the American landmass and indigenous cultures, uh, do these fantasies feed into right-wing fantasies? Um, I cannot answer that question um, scientifically. I, I will say yes, but, um, but more research is needed to really show the ways in which this is, this is done. So just to summarize, and what I, what I want to, to stress here is that this, um, this imagining of um, Norse and indigenous contact as it is done in popular culture, not only in computer games, but also in, in um, comic books, in, in uh, uh, films and, and in other ways, uh, this opens up for a blurred understanding of chronology and also the geographical remit. It exaggerates contact. It, it also allows for identity construction, which in terms opens up to abuse. So when we see what happened in, um, in the insurrection at, at Capitol Hill, January 6th, we must see this blending of, of indigenous and Norse um, cultural expressions as um, or in, in the light of this... Um, popular cultural background. Um, and again, how this is done, the, well, that, that simply uh, awaits further study. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice paper, uh, which actually fitted very well the uh, theme of the former one. Uh, uh, it's a nice sequence. And uh, we immediately switch to uh, the third paper in this section. Uh, that by Jordan Waltz. Jordan uh, graduated with an MA in Medieval History from CU and a BA in English from the University of Puget Sound. And uh, his academic focus is on medievalism. He's currently researching depictions of the Middle Ages in video games from the US and Japan. For his previous MA, he wrote his thesis on the changing meaning of the Arpad stripes, the so-called Arpad shaft during the Middle Ages, which had been expropriated by right-wing movements in Hungary. And he was also a recipient of the Svetlana Mihaly Tanasa Memorial Fund uh, Prime and also a Sandler Critical Essay Award, UPS uh, uh, 2016. 
and his paper is entitled The Devil Wears a Wizard's Robe, Medievalism in the Religious Rites Discourse Surrounding Dungeons and Dragons. Jordan. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. I've been trying to make sure that I get this all set up in advance. Okay, I think you, call, you all can see it, see it now, right? You can also see that I've um, changed the uh, title of my paper. Um, as I sort of refocused this, uh, this topic to look at more of what I'm looking at in my current thesis. And my current thesis is um, for my master's program um, in history in the public sphere is about um, the interaction between uh, Japanese localization and um, sort of the U.S. cultural climate regarding medievalism at the time. Um, so uh, let me second. Let me just get this out of the way. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to be primarily talking about the Dungeons and Dragons panic in the 1980s um, and the way that this manifests as a form of public medievalism. And I just want to provide a content warning here. Um, there is discussion of child and teen suicide and murder, and I can understand if this is like sort of a difficult topic. Um, okay, so I, I have this slide in here because um, even though in the Dungeons and Dragons community, um, we may see this period and these sorts of uh, attitudes that are expressed as something of a meme. Um, but it's important to remember that these um, were ideas that were taken relatively seriously, not just in um, religious circles or religious fundamentalist circles, but were also um, ideas that were entertained um, by the public at large. Um, as we've seen with movements like QAnon, for example, it's not necessary to be a Christian in order to believe that there are satanic cults which pose a, a serious public threat. Um, so even though this is something of a meme, um, it's, it's important to take it seriously. Um, so to give a bit of an overview, um, this paper uh, is, um, oh, whoops, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, so this, the, my, my main argument here is that um, the neo-medievalism discussed is um, and was inspired by Dungeons and Dragons and is used to aestheticize the anxieties of religious conservatives and concerned parents with regards to the ability of children's media to propagate violence and Satanism. Um, this phenomenon begins in Christian media circles, but it quickly spreads into more secular spheres through mainstream media outlets, um, news, investigative journalism, and films. Um, in this discourse, neo-medievalism is used to represent a dangerous fantasy, which can blur children's distinctions between fantasy and reality, leading to real-world violence. Um, and this sort of played a very formative role in the question of uh, interactive media and its relationship to violence, um, a question which we still uh, deal with today. Um, and I kind of want to underline some of the terminology that I'm using, especially because I'm using neo-medievalism. Um, these are some authors that I've, 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 whose work I'm, 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 I'm very indebted to, and whose work I'm, I've has been critical to understanding medievalism for myself and presenting it in this paper. First is Helen Young um, in Fantasy and Science Fiction Medievalisms, essentially making a statement that it's valuable and necessary to historicize um, medievalisms, and in this case, certain neo-medievalisms. Um, Elliot in uh, Medievalism, Politics, and Mass Media mentions that um, mass midi Middle Ages and mass media does not always recall the it does not recall the past and the present, but it often rejects the past in service of shared cultural repository of symbols. And that's sort of what I'm going to be arguing. Um, this uh, Middle Ages is sort of participating. This the Middle Ages exists as within the context of of, um, of this time period. And I use neo medievalism primarily to index the use of medieval aesthetics without a direct historical referent and to emphasize its highly mediated nature with the medieval. Um, I have sort of a working definition of this that I'm using as well, but I will just kind of keep it brief for, for, for this right now. And finally, I'm using um, Paul B. Strudevant's work on public medievalism. Paul B. Strudevant is the admin of the blog, The Public Medievalist. That's probably how you're familiar with his work. Um, but he has a book called the, Pop the Middle Ages in Popular Imagination, where he looks at the Middle Ages in film, and he attempts to get an understanding of what the so-called public medievalism was, or the historical consciousness of the medieval world that is the origin instances of medievalism. To arrive at this point, he takes a very uh, quantitative approach, um, and I'm hoping that I can do something that's a little bit more qualitative. I'm hoping that I can, um, through discourse analysis, sort of arrive at a conclusion. 
Um, so it's important that we provide some context first. Um, during the 70s and starting at the end of the 60s, um, there were a number of murders, child molestation cases, which were inflected with um, quote unquote ritualistic elements. Um, you know, the Manson family, um, there's the Zodiac killer and the Alphabet killer. And these were all pretty well publicized. Um, around 1960, in 1969, Anton LaVey, who sort of becomes the main figure with which people are having this discourse with regards to Satanism, um, he publishes the Satanic Bible in uh, 1969. And um, the person on the uh, cover of this Time magazine over here um, is actually from LaVey's Church of Satan. And to kind of give you an understanding of the public representation of Satanism uh, during this time period, um, I'll read from an ending paragraph um, in this article. There is a danger, of course, in taking the devil too lightly, for in doing so, man might take evil too lightly. Recent history has shown terrifyingly well that the demonic lies barely beneath the surface, ready to catch men unawares with new and more horrible manifestations. But the devil taken too seriously can become the ultimate scapegoat, the excuse for the world's evils and the justification for men's failure to improve themselves. And um, this... Uh, concern, this 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 pan, this um, concern about Satanism sort of runs and into the end of the 70s, um, and during this time period, um, a number of the advances in feminist and queer um, movements uh, had resulted in um, a uh, political backlash, to use Susan Faludi's terminology, um, which uh, the main sort of organized wing of was called the Moral Majority. Um, this is where Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson um, really begin to sort of make their name known and to also make a lot of money. Um, they uh, play a large role in the election of Ronald Reagan as president. Um, and furthermore, their, their group um, essentially serves as a pattern for further conservative advocacy groups. Um, as I know, it's also sort of important to give some context about Dungeons and Dragons. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, but uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, was developed from the medieval war game Chainmail um, in 1974, and it borrows heavily from uh, Robert Howard's Conan series and Tolkien's Middle Earth. Um, with regards to sort of the periodization and the historicization of it, though, um, the, uh, Gary, one of Gary Dyax's comments on this in um, a supplement called Oriental Adventures, a book that was designed in order to be able to play Dungeons and Dragons um, in, quote, the Far East. Um, says that this game stressed a European historical base in mythology. Even though the AD&D game monster roster range is far afield, it's still basically of European flavor. And in this we can see sort of like a pretty fun, like a pretty classic definition of what Chakrabarty refers to as hyperreal Europe, uh, in which an image of Europe precedes a geography of it. Um, and uh, sort of furthermore commenting on this sort of medieval setting, um, Daniel Dyan, uh, in a review of uh, Gary Allen Fine's book, Shared Fantasy, Role-Playing Games of Social Worlds. Um, and this is sort of one of the books uh, in the 1980s where people are really trying to talk about Dungeons and Dragons in sort of an academic context, as opposed to um, sort of this more public discourse. Um, discusses uh, in, in responding to the question, uh, what shared myths does Dungeons and Dragons operate on? Um, he comes to an interesting conclusion. Um, concerning the first of these directions, let us briefly consider the nature of historical settings proposed by fantasy role-playing games. These settings are often medieval or pseudo-medieval, but not necessarily so. Medieval Europe as a fantasy world is not only situated in a conveniently other time and on a distant continent, but it is read, according to a now obsolete historical paradigm, as a dark interval, an interruption between periods of enlightenment. The Middle Ages are perceived here as that chaos that comes when civilization has collapsed, a parenthesis open to the rule of violence and to the imperative of using it first, an outlet for the release of irrationality. This chaotic universe suggests at least a double metaphoric dimension. It allows adolescents to come to terms with their uncertainty, with the internal chaos inherent in their transitory status. It also translates, projects on, into a historical elsewhere, the interruptive liminal character of the gaming session itself. And so in discussion of this gaming session, and of what this gaming session is, um, players are intended to play a character within a collaborative storytelling game. And this process, this game, or this story is facilitated by a dungeon master who has complete authority within this imaginative realm. Um, and it's sort of this investment in a fictive character and the authority of the dungeon master that becomes the focus of concern by critics, um, particularly because for a lot of people, this resembles a cult. Um, 
the uh, first edition, the uh, the, uh, the first edition, um, and you can see the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide picture on your right, um, contained various occult imagery and symbols. And uh, there is this reformed Satanist named William Schoenbellen, and I'm, I'm sort of using this in quotes um, because his his um, his statements haven't been verified. Um, who claims that he was consulted by the authors in order to ensure that the book was authentic and that it could be used as an instruction manual for the occult. Um, and sort of the controversy surrounding Dungeons and Dragons um, results in a series of content changes between the first and second editions, primarily, primarily with the omission of demons and much of the um, assorted iconography. Um, so uh, moving into the beginning of this controversy and the events of this controversy are very important in discussing its media depictions. Um, there are two suicides of young players which captures popular uh, attention and imagination. Um, the first is James Dallas Egbert III. Um, he disappears into a set of steam tunnels beneath his university, uh, and he uh, eventually runs away to Louisiana um, and commits suicide. Um, this investigator who's hired to go up after him um, named William Deere writes a book called The Dungeon Master, um, which is more speculative. And he suggests that he went into these steam tunnels in order to live action role play Dungeons and Dragons or to, for, to uh, do Dungeons and Dragons in real life, um, which is something that is actually like a relatively common form of, of role playing. And um, there was a fictional novelization of mazes and a fictional novelization of this called Mazes and Monsters, um, which was adapted into a film of the same name. And I will discuss this film in detail um, later on. Um, and then there is Patricia and Irving Pulling. Um, Irving is Patricia's son. Uh, Irving commits suicide in uh, 1982, and Patricia blames Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons, um, claiming that his character was cursed with a quote unquote suicide curse before he killed himself. And it's sort of important to mention here that um, there's nothing about a suicide curse that exists inside of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. It's possible that um, the suicide curse was something that the dungeon master had created and had given to Irving, or it's possible that it's also an invention. Um, and uh, she sues uh, TSR, the company that publishes Dungeons and Dragons, and founds a group called Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons, um, claiming that it promotes Satanism and suicide. Um, so for moral panics, um, I'm using uh, Cohen's definition in his book, Folk Devils and Moral Panics, um, quote, a condition, episode, or per a condition, episode, person, or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians, and other right-thinking people. Socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnoses and solutions. Ways of coping are evolved or more often resorted to. The condition then disappears, submerges, or deteriorates and becomes more visible. And that's sort of precisely what happens um, with the Dungeons and Dragons panic, as this becomes more of a conversation about the role of violence in children's media that would relate in the creation of the Internet Entertainment Software Ratings Board um, in the 1990s, uh, uh, a, a sort of collection that would um, determine whether or not specific video games were um, suitable for children to play based on the content that was within them. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons is, is important to talk about because it existed at an intersection of various moral panics of the decade and sort of became a flashpoint. Um, as many of these I've sort of mentioned before, um, satanic panic, violence in children's media, well-publicized cases of teen suicide and murder. And um, the approach that I'm taking to this is sort of inspired by um, Joseph Laycock, who wrote a book called Dangerous Games. Um, and uh, his conclusion looking at this is that um, the concern about Dungeons and Dragons was located in children's socialization and that the boundary between the imagined world and the real world was permeable, um, particularly through the space of imagination. And he actually comes to a conclusion that there is more in common between um, religion and these tabletop role playing games than they would initially let on. And he says um, they are both concerned with constructing new worlds in which tragedy is rendered sensible. And if the forces of chaos cannot be annihilated, we can at least fight them as heroes. Um, and this is sort of very present in much of the uh, medievalism that the critics um, of Dungeons and Dragons or, or those who are concerned about Dungeons and Dragons utilize in their response to it. Um, and to this extent, um, the re-representation of Dungeons and Dragons by its opponents and critics produces its own forms of medievalism, which are worthy of study. 
Um, and so in discussing which medievalism we're talking about, um, it's important to remember that um, we are operating at several levels of mediation from the actual medieval at this point. Um, and, but, and also more importantly, we're also operating at sort of um, uh, uh, a loose derivation of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but primarily it's aesthetics are used to illustrate the anxieties that these, um, that, 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 that these people are holding. Um, and I wanna, um, and I've sort of noted two points which I think are the most common. Um, the neo-medieval is the space of a violent fantasy which children and young adults can bring in, into the world through the liminal space of imagination. Likewise, it can be a setting in which children are introduced into witchcraft. Um, and this is uh, actually um, sort of very evident in this film called Skullduggery off to the right. Um, and if you're looking for a more direct reference to a historical Middle Ages, I would recommend looking at Skullduggery, a low-budget Canadian horror film released on VHS in 19, uh, 1983, which begins in 14th century England with a character who resembles Anton LaVey and is named Dr. Evil, telling a captured noble, either you play or you die, suggesting that the film's version of Dungeons and Dragons was played during the Middle Ages. This character is also revealed to be the dungeon master for the protagonist of the film, who murders young women at his behest. As you can tell by the quality of the writing, this film was not received well and was not nearly as influential to the discourse as the media, which I will be discussing. Um, so my the, the main film that I'll be discussing is Mazes and Monsters, which sort of is one of the Ur texts of the period. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, another telling aspect of this sort of neo-medievalism is that subterranean spaces are medievalized into dungeons through the delusion or the fanaticism of its players. Um, this uh, comic strip that you see on the bottom part of the screen is from Jack Chick, um, a prominent evangelical uh, comic artist. Um, and this is from one of his um, most well-known works um, called Dark Dungeons, of which there's also been a satirical adaptation made by people um, who are filmmakers in the Dungeons and Dragons community. And one thing that I kind of want to comment on um, that I really wanted to expand upon more um, was that there's strong similarities in between this neo-medievalism and the sort of medievalism of the Gothic tradition um, that I would really enjoy kind of plumbing into a little bit deeper, but I want to specifically point to B.M. Murphy's um, suburban Gothic. Um, and I also want to say that this is sort of reflective of similar concerns in media of the time, such as um, Shattered Screens and Killer Tapes um, by Benson Allen. Um, and so uh, before I talk about um, Mazes and Monsters, I want to give a brief overview of the state of audiovisual media. Um, in 1981, um, Ronald Reagan's FCC deregulates children's television, um, and this leads to sort of an explosion of programming, um, which critics refer to as program length commercials. If you have lived any time between the 1980s and maybe the early 2000s, you're sort of very aware of what this is. Um, a number of television shows which exist in order to sell a specific product. Um, I think uh, transmedia properties is sort of another way of talking about it, but that's a little bit different, um, mainly coming about um, when Pokemon is able to sort of really change the game. Um, and the two um, sort of notable neo-medieval texts from here is He-Man and the Dungeons and Dragons animated series, the latter of which is actually um, animated in Japan. Um, and uh, there's a, a videotape um, by the Eagle Nest Ministries, um, which is a uh, direct to VHS um, Christian evangelical uh, media company um, uh, in which uh, Gary Greenwald and Phil Phillips um, produce a video called Deception of a Generation, which aims to inform parents about how media is uh, used to indoctrinate children into the occult through the repeated use of occult symbolism. Um, as I mentioned this during this time, or did I mention during this, as I mentioned during this time, um, there's an expansion of evangelical media. Um, you have specialty television channels, um, programming on mainstream networks, and then video and audio cassette by mail programs. Um, and this is all sort of used to stoke the controversy. And many of these concerns um, eventually get mainstreamed and are addressed on major programs for major networks um, and occasionally public networks, such as the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, 60 Minutes, and uh, Geraldo Rivera, who was sort of a popular late night television host during the period, um, had a segment called Devil Worship Exposing Satan's Underground, um, which was incredibly highly rated for the time period. Um, and uh, it's also important to mention, because we're no longer living in this world, that direct to VHS films were common. Um, this sort of changed the way that people viewed film within the privacy of their house and the way that they also sort of perceived film as operating outside of it. Um, we're talking about Mazes and Monsters here. Um, Mazes and Monsters was Tom Hanks's first uh, starring role. Um, you may be familiar with the actor. Um, 
uh, the the film is a fictionalized account of Egbert's suicide um, and provides a lot of original narrative to it. Um, so to kind of give a summary, um, the uh, fictionalized Egbert played by uh, uh, Tom Hanks goes to college um, and he plays Mazes and Monsters, the uh, film's version of Dungeons and Dragons against his mother's wishes. Um, and in this, he's a cleric. And it's, you know, another thing that's kind of important to, to, to mention that I'm not entirely sure what to do with just yet is um, the anxiety surrounding um, um, clerics or priestly figures as they are represented in Dungeons and Dragons. If you would recall from the um, Jack Chick comic, um, the protagonist in there, um, Elf Star, is a cleric. Um, and uh, in this, he engages in a live action role playing experience where his group goes into a cave beneath the university. Um, in fright, he sees a monster called a Gorville um, in the top right, and he attacks it. Um, and this sort of is the beginning of where um, his barrier between real and fantasy sort of begins to blur. Um, and then and later on, his character dies, um, and he believes that he has sort of become his character, that his character sort of lives on inside of him. Um, he then travels to New York in order to, quote, uh, consult the sage of the two towers, um, which is, of course, both a reference to Tolkien, Tolkien's work and a reference to the World Trade Center. Um, in the sewers of New York, he meets a homeless man whom he believes to be the sage, um, stabs a mugger whom he believes to be the same monster as before, and goes to jump off of um, the uh, World Trade Center. At this um, point, I'm Jordan, Jordan, sorry, you have three minutes left. Uh, at this point, he is confronted by his fellow players who bring him back to reality, and the movie ends with him trapped in his delusion, um, living in the countryside with his family. Um, so obviously there's differences between here and between this and the Egbert story. Um, and uh, it's again important to sort of mention that this, this narrative is the origin point for many of the later depictions of Dungeons and Dragons in the media. Um, and so in, in, in conclusion, um, the neo-medievalism of the religious right um, emerged from various moral panics, particularly the satanic panic and well-publicized child violence instances, and found its expression within the aesthetics of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, this medieval is expressed as a fantasy world which corrupts children, impelling them towards violence and Satanism. This occurs through the media and situates parents as guardians of their children by advocating that they regulate their children's media consumption. Uh, this medievalism expanded into secular areas as well as the topic was discussed on secular programs and engaged with other moral panics before disappearing at the end of the decade. However, similar concerns about violence in video games would result in the creation of the ESRB in the 1990s. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was a very nice and very rich uh, presentation and also uh, bringing us to real problems to debate and to discuss how uh, medievalism uh, can be a social uh, problem and how uh, it is being discussed. So now the discussion is starting and uh, uh, I announce again uh, that you should write your questions in the chat and then uh, I would call or everyone will help me to call uh, people to work. And while you were thinking, I still, uh, I take the privilege of asking the uh, first questions. Well, actually, I have a question uh, which is uh, uh, tying uh, uh, the two first uh, presentations together. And then I will have a question also to Jordan, but that I, I can postpone uh, if there are others. So uh, my first question is, uh, so I was uh, very, uh, uh, very glad that uh, the paper uh, of uh, uh, Stephen Hope uh, was coming after that of Annika Christensen because the two were actually communicate with each other uh, uh, in that uh, uh, aspect that uh, Stephen brought some examples uh, how uh, these Northmen, these white Northmen did uh, or do get actually uh, juxtaposed to uh, indigenous uh, and people of color. Uh, w one thing which came to my mind also uh, although it's not video game, but the Vikings, the Vikings is ending uh, uh, also with the uh, Northmen uh, arriving to uh, America and uh, meeting there uh, some indigenous people. Now, uh, my question is the following, uh, is that uh, if uh, uh, these Northmen are uh, in a way white superiors, uh, uh, is there, isn't there also another aspect which somehow uh, kind of uh, 
in conflict is in conflict that they are kind of savages so the vikings are depicted as a kind of savages this is why they can be confronting the indigenous this is why uh, actually they are uh, taken as savages by the anglo-saxon or the russian uh, in various uh, ways so the other nordic type of uh, white people so do you see that conflict or that uh, double identity somewhere uh, uh, expressed or uh, played upon in, in in video games that you analyze and just one additional little question uh, besides whiteness uh, is there uh, the traditional stereotype of nordic people that having blonde hair and blue eyes is it there too So it's both to Annika and to Stefan. Uh, maybe Annika could start answering. Um, well, I can kind of answer from the viewpoint uh, of kind of what I've been studying. So, for example, um, in the game Valhalla, where the the kind of the Norwegians come to to England, um, they are seen as savages and heathens and um all of that but in the game there is as well this kind of like the vikings are kind of almost seen as can the underdogs so they are coming you know they are maybe 20 30 and they manage to kind of conquer the whole of england you know so so yeah there is definitely this 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 kind of contrast between um, as being viewed as something, yes, slightly superior, but also kind of uh, invasive and barbaric. Um, and I think, you know, that's, um, it's interesting to see like where these kind of narratives are created. Um, and these are also kind of prevalent narratives in, in kind of far right rhetoric, uh, both in Scandinavia, but also um, in the kind of Scandinavian heritage communities um, in the US, where they kind of rely on that Nordic or white superiority or as kind of, you know, the authentic Vikings and all of that. Thank you. Now, Stefan. <clears throat> well, I, thank you for that. It, it's a very good question. And I, I want to be a bit... Um, Difficult because on the one hand, I think that there definitely is a, um, a presentation of the, bar the barbarian aspect of the Vikings. Let's use that term for now, but not necessarily the savage. I think there is a sort of, um, there is a, in certain types of aesthetic, at least, there is a, a glorification of the, of the barbarian as a contrast to the overly civilized um, but not necessarily savage. I think that is, is reserved for, um, well, non-white um, ethnicities in, in many cases. But that's more a general thing. I, I, there are some, some interesting differences, uh, not in audiovisual media, but if we go back to Prince Valiant, for instance, you, it is, um, the whole, that whole comic strip does operate with a certain contrast between the more refined Valiant, who is, of course, of, of British, British extraction, uh, and he is the one who dons armor. He has a more you know, refined um, way of, of being. And then you have the Norwegians who are clad in, in pelt, and they are uh, naked torsos, and, and it is exactly one of those who, who marries the the uh, indigenous woman Tilikum in, in the story that I, I um, mentioned in the uh, in the presentation. I don't know how much I should go into to that particular example. I don't know how representative it is, but I think there is a, a sort of balancing act that is being done that, you, that that a lot of people who engage with the with Vikings and the Norse in in popular culture they do want to emphasize the barbaric, but at the same time. They want to make them not savages, but but sort of a prototype of the modern or certain modern cultural trends. Um, as for the the question of the the blonde hair and blue eyes, I I think that is um, also something that 
ab absolutely uh, appears. But very often uh, I've, I've seen Vikings depicted as having red hair and red beard. And I, I think that is something that ultimately goes back to the idea that it was Eric Graude who came to, to Greenland, if not to Vinland, but um, sometimes sometimes uh, father and son there is, is uh, conflated into one person. So you have um, both in Age of Empires, the, the, the Vikings have red hair. Uh, I think in Settlers 4 as well, there are other examples like um, there was one game called um, Frozen Islands New Horizons, which is a very uh, Irish um pastiche in a way. So, so you see that, that definite Caucasian, archetypal Caucasian um, appearance, it really becomes a, an, an element in how and how we recognize Vikings in, in these uh, cultural expressions. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much. And I apologize for the uh, savage. I didn't mean to <laughs> offend the Nordic people, but I, I mean, I, I had the idea that, that it was a type of uh, so, so the military belligerent nature. But actually, that's true that uh, that that type of barbarian identity is also a kind of deliberate uh, opposition to certain uh, uh, civilized people who are uh, felt uh, uh, rather uh, rather uh, kind of lower, uh, uh, having lower manhood or uh, things like that. Thank you. And we have now questions, several. several. So uh, first there is Erzsébet Kovács. And uh, so uh, her question is uh, uh, for Anika. <clears throat> Would you like to put it yourself, Erzsébet? Why are you switching in? Uh, I, I, I'm telling you. I so mean, if, if, you, if, if Ershavet wants to, to expand on the question, please write it on the chat and I will unmute you. Okay. Okay, in any, mm. any case, in, in the meantime, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm uh, so are you there, Ershavet? Uh, no, then, then maybe it's better if you okay, read the question. Okay, so you know. uh, the question is there and it's very good. So do you think, Annika, that uh, there might be a connection between this Nordic whiteness and the corpse paint invented and used by heavy metal bands and fans? And a note to Stefan, uh, let me mention a scene uh, in the proposal, uh, 2009, uh, where uh, one of the characters played Betty White, performs a mock indigenous, indigenous ritual just because she's Alaskan and they are preparing for the wedding of the main characters. Question to Jordan also. Do you think that there might be a connection with other instances of moral panic, such as the famous case of Judas Priest? Okay, so uh, in the row, Annika first. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for that question, because uh, you know it is really interesting. And I have to admit, when I saw the question, I had to look up what corpse paint was because I'm not that familiar with it. Um, but I, I have to say, I don't really know if you can draw connections because I think in in a lot of kind of heavy metal subgenres, um, you know, it is very kind of theatrical, and I think from what I can see from the corpse paint use is more kind of associated with um, a kind of a, a fascination with or an act mean, uh, actment of um, uh, death. Uh, so I think it's more of an, a, a kind of extreme expression um, in relation to that and, and, and not... To me, it doesn't seem as much as kind of a link to this kind of Nordic or whiteness. Right. Okay. So, Stefan, about Betty White. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, I haven't um, watched it. I, I was unaware of it. So, so this is... Um, this is something I'm, I'm going to watch and, and have a, a good think about because I, I think it also ties in with how Betty White, um, especially considering that she played in the Golden Girls, she played this archetypal Norwegian American who is a bit dim and, and who is from the town called St. Olaf. 
Um, and now she is then playing a mock indigenous ritual. I, I think we might stretch that to say something about how these two cultural um, identities are often played with and intertwined and, and not always in a good way in, in American media. So thank you very much for that. I, I, I really appreciate it. Right. And Jordan, how about Judas Priest? Yes, um, actually, uh, so I'm not terribly familiar with Judas Priest's specific case, um, but the answer, the answer is, is, is yes. Um, the uh, Geraldo Rivera uh, show that I mentioned earlier actually had Ozzy Osbourne on as a panelist and Geraldo Rivera would explain like something that these Satanists did and that they were fans of, of Ozzy Osbourne and they would turn to Ozzy Osbourne and ask like, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what is your thoughts on the responsibility of this? Um, and I think the phrase that's typically used to sort of describe um, this, 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 this sort of relationship between someone putting out um, a message that might be considered to uh, be one that invokes violence and then an invocation of violence sort of in a way that isn't able to draw a direct connection is usually called stochastic violence. And um, much like Judas Priest, um, the uh, de de developers of Dungeons and Dragons um, sort of were not held liable um, sort of as a result of, of all of this uh, of, 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 of all of um, the, the controversies which were happening. But it should also be mentioned that there's there's a scene sort of that I wanted to touch upon because I really want to understand how um, sort of the music of the time period influences and plays into this neo-medievalism. Um, there's a scene in Skullduggery where the protagonist is, is, is chasing someone that they're trying to kill and they're chasing them through a graveyard and he's dressed in a complete, you know, knight's, knight's outfit. Um, like, you know, but it's like kind of like this, like, yeah, anyways, he's, he's dressed in a knight's outfit. And they run across this, um, the gra this grave where um, this uh, old woman's playing at. And uh, the old woman responds, um, what did you think this was a, a, a Rolling Stones concert? So like, there's, there's, there's clearly some sort of connection here between the two that I think is very interesting. Yes. Right. Okay, thank you. And uh, Karen Cook uh, has also a question, not a question, but for Jordan. I've been rewatching, she says, uh, the original Unsolved Mysteries series that aired in the late 80s and early 90s. And I was struck by how frequently the satanic panic and the supposed moral dangers of things like DMD were mentioned. So how, how do you feel about that? I, I've never seen it, but thank you very much for the recommendation. I'm, I'm more than happy to watch it. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, if I may, I, I have a question. If I yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, all of you, for your papers. They were very, very interesting. Um, my question is mostly related to what Stephen uh, explained, but of course, if the two of you also would like to to participate in the answer, feel free to. Uh, uh, Annika, in her presentation, mentioned this series, Vikings, which I think Stephen, maybe you're also uh, real, uh, aware of. And definitely in the last couple of years, one has seen something of a boom of Viking productions, call it The Last Kingdom or Vikings or God of War or Assassin's Creed, uh, whatever. And something that really caught my attention in the last season, the show ended last January, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, is that the show ends with Uber, the son of Ragnar, with his small band, arrives in America, he meets Native Americans, everything is very peaceful, everything is very cordial until one Viking steals uh, some gold and kills a Native America, American, and then kind of like the, the implied message is that that ruins their relationship. Why am I bringing this case? Because I was very interested in what, what Stephen mentioned of these categories of extended contact, extended geography. And, I, and it got me thinking in this particular context uh, right now in which precisely this legacy of European colonizers or U European discoverers is very much put into question. Um, I think that the best example will be Christopher Columbus, who more and more, at least among the left-wing political groups or maybe the popular imagination is starting to be seen as this huge enslaver and killer of Native Americans instead of the idea of the discoverer. So what I would like to ask you is if maybe there could be a connection into this re, how to put it, re-emphasizing the supposed, well, not the supposed, but the arrival of North of Nordic peoples into the United States and trying to re-emphasize their medievalist impact, which we know that historical is very difficult to determine in opposition to may, or maybe as a reaction to this growing, uh, uh, growing condemnation 
of characters like Christopher Columbus, uh, which of course the left really pretty much wants to criticize, but also kind of serves then as the right wing appropriation of these Nordic peoples as saying, uh, we are really coming from, I don't know, uh, Scandinavia or whatever. I don't know if my question is clear, but yeah, thank you. Right. So <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that is a very interesting uh, very interesting observation, and I I think that there is. I, I think that 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 what you um, point to is is a very is a very good reminder of how these these myths can also be uh, subversed in a way because the the ending of uh, Vikings the, the way that the Norse contact is seen as disruptive and as a sort of proto well proto-Columbian in, in the negative way. Um, I, th I think that is definitely something that must be understood in light of, of contemporary debates about um, conquest and discovery and, and how we understand these as, as heroic uh, endeavors, uh, which is the, the form or the typical historical canonical uh, interpretation of these events in the 19th and, and 20th century. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I, I think that there, there definitely is a good reason to understand this, um, well, subvers subversion of the traditional narrative uh, in light of contemporary criticism against a glorified uh, view of colonial history. And, and because um, so much of, of popular discourse, not just culture, but uh, not just popular culture, but also the general discourse has emphasized the, the Norse as as proto-Columbian explorers, this is now turned into something negative. It's the um, it's proto-Columbian, but in exactly the same bad way as Columbus was was a disruptive uh, starting point or a disruptive uh, time shift. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you very much for that. I I, I want to develop that a bit further in in my my um, thoughts before I, I say more about that, but, but thank you so much for, for noting that. And I, I want to, to say, if I may, um, some, some uh, a, a curious case of, of how Norse and, and um, Colombian contact is intertwined. There is actually a, a, there was a claim that came about in the 1990s that uh, Christopher Columbus was from my village in the Norwegian fjords. And this has made national headlines in, in Norway from, uh, from time to time. We even have a Columbus Park. Anyway, that is beside the, that, that's a bit outside the, the remit of the question, but there, there definitely is a sort of interplay between these two paradigms, the Norse and the Colombian, and, and they can be done in the traditional way, in the heroic way, and can be done subversively. And yeah, it, it opens up for a lot of, of imagination. Thank you. Well, the last question uh, is, uh, should be uh, from Francis Mikus, who, uh, who has three questions, actually, to all the three speakers. And if you allow me to resume, it's just very briefly. Uh, so to Ani for Annika, is, uh, about not, is not authentic, somewhat self-fulfilling, that it uh, feeds on preconception. Uh, and uh, also that Morrison's quip uh, on whiteness uh, and hyphenization, uh, uh, hyphenation is even tighter than simply white, but it's a great line. And for Stephen, in ten, uh, testing instance of extension is in uh, the French comic book Asterix. <laughs> That's very good to bring it in uh, here uh, with its episodes on the voyage to North America. Uh, both indigenous and Norse, and also for Jordan, uh, that the DND debacle is another instance of how a new medium is at first ignored and then vilified when it becomes too unavoidable. In the 19th century and the novel, uh, early film uh, with its most famous. I have already <coughs> reacted to it. We are at the end of the time of the session and we might need a short break. So I would ask all the three speakers to be just very concise and say a word of reaction to Francis. <laughs> 
Uh, maybe before you start answering, if you're comfortable with, please write your email accounts in the in the chat box in case if so you can get like further questions from the audience. Thank you. So last word, Annika. Yeah, well, I can quickly say about uh, authenticity, and I, I use it a lot in my paper, but it is a very problematic term. And uh, I, I fully agree that there is preconceptions of what we assume to be authentic, and therefore it must be represented as such to be authentic. Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for those points. Uh, the the asterisk um, in America, is a, that's a great example how, how um, chronology is extended and, and also how, um, how modern American imagery is, is transposed onto a historical period. So thank you very much for, for, for that. Uh, also, when it comes to the um, question of a desire to, reinforcing, to reinforce existing communities in, in Minnesota and in the Scandinavian communities, the simple answer is yes. And I think that has been going on uh, ever since the 19th century, in the case of the Kensington Runestone hoax, for instance, and and that continues to to sort of be a self-reinforcing um, current in in that particular cultural climate. So, thank you, yeah, Jordan. Yeah, so I mean, my my, my answer to my, my answer is absolutely. Um, there has always been sort of anxieties that have surrounded new media as it's come up, and I still think we're still grappling with a lot of those anxieties when it comes to things like Facebook, especially now that these mediums have an opportunity to change at a dime. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll ever truly, truly feel settled with some of these new mediums. Um, but I recommended a book by uh, Caitlin Benson Allett um, called Killer Tapes and Shattered Screens, Video Spectatorship from VHS to File Sharing, which sort of looks at the way that film is transmitted between people um, through the form of piracy um, as sort of an indicate and the way that this is represented on film as sort of like an indication of like anxieties re regarding this topic. So absolutely. Okay, thank you all. And let me, uh, by concluding, give back the word to Evren, uh, who was the organizer. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I mean this was uh, like a great session. Um, um, so now we are moving on to our last, but not at all the least, you know, meeting, um, the closing keynote lecture to be given by Andrew Elliott from University of Lincoln. Uh, between the screens of medievalism. So see you at 3.30. <laughs>